So I have, have great pleasure in introducing um, one former student and one new-ish colleague and very, very dear friend. Uh, I'll start with the latter, that's Father Bogdan Vitor, who uh, was born in Romania and began his theological studies there in uh, Bucharest and then came to the U.S. where he took first a master's and then a doctoral degree at Marquette, uh, where he forged a very close academic and uh, also personal relationship with Father, now Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn, uh, and we really feel the the character of that relationship uh, in, in Father Alexander's teaching and in Father Bogdan's teaching on uh, the Church Fathers and uh, specifically also on the reading of Scripture. Um, Father Bogdan came here in the fall of 2020 with his family, who are dear, dear friends with me and my family, his wife, Christina, his three children, Irina, Andre, and Miruna. Uh, so I'm always happy to introduce you, my friend, Father Bogdan. And Alex Titus, I uh, haven't seen you since you graduated in 2016 with your THM from St. Vladimir's, before which you got a master's degree in St. Vladimir's. Since then, you've got a doctorate. Look at you. Uh, and uh, I, I'm thrilled to know that your doctorate is on the reception of um, Dionysius in St. Gregory Palamas. So that's fantastic. Uh, your doctorate is from Princeton Theological Seminary. So uh, we're really proud of alumni like you. Uh, you know, we, we certainly train uh, ordained or ordainable uh, leaders of the church. We ordain, uh, we also, uh, our alumni are... Uh, teachers, choir directors, scholars, missionaries, uh, men and women uh, of very diverse gifts. Um, and it's a real joy uh, to see you, Alex, Dr. Titus, uh, and uh, I wish you and your family in Oregon all the best. And I look forward to your conversation. Um, but you know, as they begin talking, consider uh, clicking svots.edu slash give and We'll all be happy. <laughs> thank you very much for the you. introduction. Um, welcome everyone to this new segment on uh, something very, very important. Uh, we are about to publish the full text of the Triads by St. Gregory Palamas. And the translator is uh, my guest today, uh, Dr. Alexander Titus. Um, it, is, uh, it is quite an event, I'm sure. Uh, many of you know that um, the um, the former dean and one of the founders of this uh, seminary, um, Father John Meindorf, edited and translated into French uh, the, the triads and made possible the dissemination and work on the triads. Well, time has come now to... Um, to have a full translation into English with um, facing Greek text. And all of this is uh, due to the efforts of um, Alexander Titus. So, <clears throat> Alex, if you would tell us a little bit um, about yourself, about uh, what happened after you finished uh, here at St. Vlad's. Um, you went to uh, uh, to Princeton Theological Seminary to get your uh, uh, your PhD. Um, your work on Dionysius, by the way, we will also be publishing relatively shortly um, the uh, Dionysian corpus into English again with uh, facing English and Greek. Um, and now you're giving us uh, Saint Gregory Palamas's triads. So tell us about yourself, about your work, uh, why you're translating this. And, of course, about St. Gregory and this particular work. Thank you, Father Bogdan. <clears throat> um, and thank you, Peter, for that <clears throat> lovely introduction. Um, I wanted to say, just before I begin, it was actually my first experience of St. Vladimir's Seminary. Um, my first time visiting the seminary was actually at Ed Day in 2012, it's 11 years ago. Um, and I took, uh, I remember uh, while I was visiting, I got to sit in on one of 
Professor Butenev's classes, actually. And I said, I'm in the right place. So <laughs> it's real, um, it's a real honor to be asked. Um, <laughs> he's giving me the thumbs up. Um, it's a real honor to be asked back and um, uh, to really to really give back. Um, so yeah, as um, as Father Bogdan said, I got my Master of Arts from St. Vladimir Seminary in 2015. Um, I went on to do a THM in 2016. Um, and then from there, I started my doctoral studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, um, studying under Paul Roram. Um, this, when I, when I first started, I kind of had this idea that I, I wanted to do something with really kind of the reception of the patristic corpus kind of in the later sort of Byzantine and or kind of Western medieval tradition. Um, I'd been working a lot on um, Eriugena kind of before that. Um, and I was really, really compelled by, by this text of the triads, but at the time we only had this abridged version, which many of you know is published by um, Paulus Press, was edited by Father John Meyendorf of Blessed Memory um, and translated by Nicholas Gendel. Um, and I and I kind of I thought to myself, well, you know, that's that's kind of too bad that we don't have the full text. Um, I don't know, maybe I should take a look at this. And um, so I started kind of just playing around, saying, okay, you know, can I maybe maybe translate some some of it that hasn't been translated? And it eventually, I think this was I was two like a year and a half, two years into my into my doc into my doctoral work at um, Princeton, and so I was still in coursework, and um, I was talking with uh, Father John Bear, the former dean, patristics professor. Um, at, at St. Vladimir's, and he was very supportive of the idea of actually publishing the triads. And I said, well, is it, is it patristic? <laughs> you know, 14th century. And he said, of course it is. You know, I said, okay, you know, so let's, let's do this. Um, and we got a contract. And so now it's, I mean, that was, ooh, 2018. Um, I want to say, yeah. So, um, so it's been you know, five years um, working on this. And I really kind of, it, it really informed what I decided to do with my doctorate. I decided kind of, I really wanted to focus on something with, with the triad specifically um, and really kind of use my translation as the basis for my own work. Um, when you translate something, you, you come to know it in sort of this, um, this, this intimate way that's sort of difficult to, uh, um, difficult to explain, I should say, but some. Allow me to uh, just briefly. Uh, yeah. to ask, um, why translate the triads of St. Gregory Palamas? We have the chapters, the theological chapters uh, translated. We have, as you said, the abbreviated, well, so some a selection of the triads. And Professor Christopher Veniamin from St. Econ's gave us the homilies. Um, but there is um, quite a bit more yeah. that we don't have. So why the triads? And I, I also wonder if you could uh, perhaps tell us why you think uh, Father John Meyendorf began with the triads as well. Yeah. And why, generally speaking, this work seems to have a particular draw um, on, on, yeah. The, yeah. on people who, who uh, are interested in studying St. Gregory Palamas. It's, yeah, that... It's difficult to answer sort of in, in words actually, um, but the text just drew me into itself. It was so profound and beautiful and um, I mean, difficult, but you know, in sort of the best possible way. And I was just like, I want to do more with this. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of, maybe a bit of a a bit of a cliche to say it was kind of like a mystical experience but sort of sort of it was um and 
and I really just just fell in love with that with that text. Um, it's it's really um, it's interesting because it it comes at really actually the earlier part of Palamas's own career as a sort of a public figure. Um, he wrote it when he was uh, probably in his early forties. Um, and he'd written a little bit before that, but this was really his first kind of, um, his first sort of um, text as a kind of public disputant, if, if you will. Um, uh, someone who sort of argued uh, theological issues in a, in a public, in a public way. But why, um, why was he writing this? I mean, yeah. I think this is, this is something that um, makes it perhaps um, appealing. Uh, why write theology? <laughs> why do the fathers generally write? Right. They don't have careers to fulfill. <laughs> they don't have academic obligations. Uh, they're not trying to get tenured. Um, <laughs> That's nice. right. That's right. Um, so writing this. Yeah, so he he wrote this because basically because people asked him to. Um, and he was resistant to it for a long time. He didn't want to get involved in any controversies. He just wanted to be by himself um, uh, in his hermitage, saying his prayers, um, <laughs> being part of a monastic community. I shouldn't say by himself, but part of his monastic community. He didn't want to be sort of a um, a public figure, but he was sort of drawn into it. People, um, people saw his, his aptitude for intelligent theological debate. And so when, when the church called upon him, when, uh, when he was, uh, when he was needed, he really rose to the occasion. I think fundamentally for me, and I think maybe maybe this is kind of um, kind of what you what you're getting at with your question. I was, I think, if I could if I could sort of put it put it in words, what what the triads is really about, and what Saint Gregory Palamas is really interested in in articulating in the triads mm. is what is the role of the mind, the noose, the intellect in the spiritual life? That's the fundamental kind of question that he's trying to, that he's trying to answer. Um, because his opponent, uh, Barlam, Barlam of Calabria, he wanted to say that the, the mind, the, the noose, and the intellect, um, whatever whatever we want to call it, that the noose really should not be involved in the spiritual life. That the noose needs to kind of go off and do its own thing. If you're if you're a monk, you can you can say your prayers, you can study scripture, you can go to the services, you can do your monastic obedience, but then you're going to have kind of a private intellectual life sort of separate from that. And that's what Paul Moss was arguing against kind of from the outset. That's sort of what set him off. He said, he said, no, that's not right. The, the noose needs to be integrated into the spiritual life. It needs to be involved in prayer. It needs to be centered in the heart um, for it to really do what it was created to do. And that's really kind of what, what the triads is about. And the kind of the, the question, the, the answer that he, that, he, that he provides, what is the role of, the, of the, the mind in the spiritual life is the mind, just like the whole, part, the whole human being, including the body, is to be deified, is to be divinized, is to participate in theosis. So then it becomes a question of, well, what do we mean by divinization, deification, theosis? 
And that kind of becomes the later part of the triad, sort of answering that question. Well, what do we mean by that? It, it will certainly not escape notice uh, that uh, we are doing this um, Ed Day this year um, on the 5th of August um, and preparing to celebrate the Transfiguration. If St. Gregor Palamas represents, as, uh, as you um, explain it, a paradigm of theology that we, uh, that we try to follow, um, that the Orthodox are, are trying to hold on to, um, we can also say that the Transfiguration, in a way, encapsulates everything he wants to say. And it's not by accident that he returns again and again and again to the feast, uh, to the hymns of the feast, uh, to the biblical accounts, um, to the experience that is uh, that is typified there. So I added here um, to the right or to the left, I don't know exactly, uh, to the right, I think, uh, on my screen, of the uh, triads um, of the, um, uh, well, of the image <clears throat> of the book, a brief, brief quotation from St. Gregory, um, which I think um, tells us what he is about. His project to, is to justify or to defend a life that already exists. It's theology that comes out of a specific life experience, a specific experience of prayer and of Christian discipline, um, and to defend this against challenges that you've um, you've just explained. So um, moving to the to the text as we do have a few texts here, I don't know how to. Ah. <clears throat> Here's a nice passage that I think would make for a, a good entry. Um, everybody knows that uh, to speak about uh, uh, the luminous experience of God or God manifested to us, uh, to us as light uh, is certainly true, and I think all Christians would agree when we speak about the age to come, because we read that the righteous will shine like the sun in the age to come. So there's no disagreement there. But um, there might be disagreement or the need for nuancing. At any rate, there's some confusion that needs to be dispelled, and he does dispel, um, on whether this is available here and now, or perhaps whether this must be available here and now in order to be then experience in the age to come. And so in some, he says, the vision of God is of this kind. I, I added bullet points there. They don't <laughs> exist of course, in the text, but that which only those deemed worthy of the blessed allotment will see in the everlasting age. All right. So the the blessed one in the, in the age to come will see God uh, as light. But then this light, which even in the present age, the chosen apostles saw directly and he's referring to the uh, transfiguration here, as well as Stephen, the first martyr, when he was being stoned. So also Anthony, St. Anthony, uh, drawing on uh, St. Athanasius' life of Anthony, as he's laboring in hesychasm, uh, and moreover, all the holy fathers, that is to say, all those who have purified their heart. So it's not only a matter of the age to come, it's a matter of the apostles. It's not only a matter of the apostles, but also the church as it begins, the apostolic uh, uh, generation, as well as all those who labor according to this tradition. Um, St. Anthony, certainly, and all those disciples of his, all those to purify their heart. Who is it among Christians that does not want to purify their heart? And I maintain, he says, that even the prophets and patriarchs, that is the Old Testament uh, holy ones, did not leave the slight untasted. And what is more, that all of their visions, except for a few, and especially the most divine of these, were not without a share in this light. I also added from the first triad, Moses also saw the light in this way, along with nearly all of the prophets. So... Nothing is left out, it seems. <laughs> and at the same time, this is what he is defending, right? Um, and we still haven't heard the word energy. And everybody knows that St. Gregory <laughs> Palmas is the theologian of divine energies. So will you please explain to us what does this have to do with the divine energies? Or rather, what, do the, what does the talk of divine energy and essence and energy have to do with 
this biblical exegesis that uh, that uh, he gives us here. <clears throat> um, right, right. I know there's so much there. When he talks about the word, when he uses the word energia, energy, he's using this word actually in a fairly particular way. And basically what he means is this is the self-manifestation of God. This is God. This is the experience of God himself. This is not something that God created to be kind of an intermediary um, between himself and creatures. This is the experience of God himself. So when we talk about light, when we talk about glory, when we talk about um, radiance, um, all these words, um, these all for Palamas kind of point to the same, the same experiential reality. When, when he uses this word also, he's drawing, and he's really drawing together, I should say, uh, a fairly substantial tradition of patristic material. He's drawing on Dionysius, especially. Uh, Dionysius uh, typically uses the word uh, dynamis or powers, um, prodi, processions. Um, Saint Maximus. The confessor will speak about the things around God, tapere theon. And sort of Palamas says all of these sort of point to the same reality, that this is God manifesting himself. Importantly, though, this is not the divine essence. He said this is like it's like a fire. It's like the sun. You can, if you experience the heat or the light of the fire, which are sort of the fire's natural energies, the way he talks about it, um, you're actually, you are experiencing the fire itself. If you put your hand straight into the fire, your hand is actually going to be destroyed. It's going to be annihilated. So that can't be, that can't be how it works. Um, but if deification, if divinization, if theosis is true, then what we're experiencing when we have a true experience of God is, is, uh, is God's energy. And so that's really, that's kind of how he sort of brings all of these, all of these elements together. When it comes to the historical question, I think, and Father, you were, you were particularly interested in how, how, you know, how does this kind of continuum work, right? You have the prophets, the patriarchs, and then you have St. Stephen and the monastic fathers, and then the age to come, right? There's kind uh, of this continuum. We'll just switch the screen to, to this uh, text that is uh, um, really going through through all these passages. Right. Um, it's a passage he ascribes to uh, St. Basil the Great, but which we know comes from the, uh, uh, the Macaron homilies. And by the way, you can you can find this uh, this text in its proper setting by just buying and reading uh, Macarius's uh, um, fifty special homilies. This is homily twenty five that he's quoting, um, and it's a it's a text that is uh, important to Saint Gregory as well as to many others that circulates this way, precisely because it it um, gathers together all these passages in which scripture speaks of an experience of God by means of uh, vocabulary uh, suggestive of light, of fire, of um, heat, uh, and so forth. So just take a look at the screen. Now here again, the word energy does not appear, but I noticed that your translation has, has a verb energize. So for this light, energized among the apostles. This is not really common English, so I'm sure you put it there because uh, you wanted to give us a sense into Eng in English that the Greek has it there. So I know there is some debate about how to translate the word energy as energy, the word energia, 
as energy, as operation, as activity, as uh, as work, as uh, it must be difficult. How did you choose uh, to translate it the way you did? He, it, the, the word energy actually is in this passage, the seeking after the energy of this fire. Right. You see that right in the middle? Yeah. So it's, so it, it, it is actually there. Yeah. So, so yeah, the word energize, right. Um, we don't typically, you know, see that um, as a verb, but really I wanted to show kind of the verbal where it does appear in, as a verb, the, um, the connection between the verb and the noun. Um, again, with Palamas, uh, he's he's not really using this word in the way that say someone like aristotle uses the word as sort of the actualization of a of a of a potential of a potentiality it's it's kind of that but it's more than that it's it's more than just um it's more than just something that's the the word activity can somehow it can sometimes uh seem make it seem like these realities are somehow fleeting or passing away um whereas for palamas these are actually yes some have a some, you know some have a beginning and he sort of gets into some technical distinctions um later in the triads but fundamentally these these are these are god's everlasting reality these are how we experience god himself so for me again sort of he's bringing together all of these where he's using energy as almost a energia is almost a uh, an analog or a or a um a synonym for what would be a big no-no in uh in Ar aristotelian philosophy for dynamies for powers for what you know potentiality something like that so i think actually he uses the word energy in a in a in a very in a in actually a fairly technical way um, so I felt like it was actually, um, it actually strengthened his meaning of the word to use, um, to use that word, to use that word energy as a translation of energia. Um, of course there are, there are good arguments on, on both sides. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that it really, when you say that heat or light are the activity of fire, right? I don't think that quite captures it, right? um it's really you know these it went, but when you say they're the energy of fire that sort of that really kind of i think even in english that sort of that really kind of strengthens it and brings it um brings it uh or brings our understanding to a to a to a it helps us to understand i should say that these are these are much more um these are stronger, abiding, more abiding realities than just we something that know, it happens must, to be doing. You know, not finish this discussion. Uh, I, I'm I'm telling this to you as well as to me, uh, so that we don't miss this without uh, um, broaching the subject of whether energy conveys a personal presence, because in everyday speech it, it does not. You know, an energy. Uh, is is an impersonal reality, whereas Saint Gregory, as you can see from this passage and the one that preceded it, um, uses it to speak about God as he interacts with his creation, uh, and as he interacts with all the pedagogical effectiveness and gentleness uh, that that belongs to God, uh, in order to transform our our apprehension of him, in order for us to flourish uh, as the as we see the, the, the prophets and the apostles um, within the glory on Mount Tabor. Um, nevertheless, even though energy is one way in which one can speak, uh, say conceptually, about what St. Gregory Palamas uh, quotes here, passes about fire and light and kingdom and glory especially, um, there, is also, uh, there is also the question of how patristic um, how shall I put it? How how justified the use of this term is uh, from the patristic tradition, because they, as they are debating uh, in Byzantium, uh, in the councils in the in the the, the councils are surrounding um, this whole um, mode of speaking about God, uh, they do more than once refer to the sixth ecumenical council, precisely for its use of the language of uh, of energy there, so. If you could walk us briefly through how this 
Christological use of energy uh, was used and how it can be it can be invoked as a precedent to uh, to the um, <coughs> hesychastic debate <coughs> just to show that he's not making things up this is not the first time surely not the first time that this is used as as an important theological term things go way back um, yeah exactly so when when we look at these um more technical uh christological debates that happened in um particularly contemporary with uh, uh saint maximus the confessor um, in the seventh century as you mentioned um there was this debate whether or not, well, does Christ have two energies or does he have one, right? And the church fairly strongly condemned the idea that Christ only had one energy. He said, no, the, the, the church said, no, and this is following the teaching of St. Maximus, said, no, Christ has a human energy and a divine energy. And nobody said, well, that means that somehow the energy is, Christ's energy is impersonal, right? Nobody, nobody seemed to be worried about that. Um, but when it comes to, when, it, when, we, when we get to the Hesychast controversy, Palamas, he also uses a fairly technical vocabulary um, to explain how this works. And the word that he uses to describe God's energy is en hypostatic, which is also drawing from the, the Christological debates, where again, like there was a there was a there was a concerted move to show that the um not just the that not just the energy but the will and the nature of christ are all substantial realities they all come from the person of christ himself so there's not they're not sort of like free floating you know um, these are, they aren't sort of self-subsistent realities. The word in Greek for that is auto-hypostatic. They don't, they don't have their own sort of separate, uh, existences apart from God and God, all the person, all three persons of the Trinity share, share the divine energies. So ultimately, when we look at the transfiguration, Palamas is going to say, that experience of divine illumination is the experience, it's the experience of who Christ truly is. It's not something that he's putting on. It's not something that he's sort of grabbing from outside of himself and sort of making a show. It's actually him showing to the, to the disciples, the chosen disciples, who he really is, showing um, allowing for this moment his his divinity to shine through. And so that experience of the of the uh, chosen disciples on Tabor at the Transfiguration is ultimately an experience again of who Christ truly is. Maybe so that that's kind of that's kind of all of you know what's sort of going on there. And there's a whole obviously there's a whole history there that we don't have time to get into. but um, but yeah, he that you're absolutely right, Father, that, Palamas is drawing very strongly from the Byzantine, um, the Byzantine technical vocabulary for these things, the technical theological vocabulary that was largely developed in, um, in the context of these Christological debates. So nobody would have been uh, or should have been surprised uh, at speaking uh, speaking about the fact that if in essence any essence um, is is conceived as as real then it must have a natural energy, a natural movement uh, by which it is defined, by which it is experienced. And so if we speak about God in this way, then uh, the same would obtain. But he seems to me to be, uh, St. Gregory, to be um, in good patristic fashion, um, not necessarily wedded to the concepts that uh, 
that come to be used um, for the sake of defending the faith. So in other words, um, the words are negotiable. What is defended by the words is non-negotiable. If you find a better way of defending the experience that is, um, uh, that is here uh, on the, um, on the, in the text, the experience of the prophets and patriarchs and apostles and saints of the church, fine. But energy seems to be a good way to, to explain this. If there is a if if there's a better way to to explain how God is the living God, that is the God who is, who is experienced and who who changes uh, people, um, then 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 to speak about God in terms of essence and energy, uh, then he will do so. In fact, doesn't he? I think in the in the theological chapters say, well, if if we speak about uh, God as uh, usia as essence, then then creatures are not who see <clears throat> Creatures are defined as who see Then God is certainly not uh, being, but hyper being, beyond being. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. So this is the the point is to defend the mode of life, and with this, um, with this, I think we have a sort of frame within which we, when we hear about energy, essence, and energy. Uh, we should certainly understand, as St. Basil put it, the, the text that is often quoted here, um, it is not that the essence is the essence of God is unknowable, the energy is unknowable. St. Basil says, God is known through the energies. So there is on Tabor not a, 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 a manifestation of energies, but a manifestation of Christ in this mode, right? Right, um, that's right. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, and it's not just known in sort of a mental sense or an intellectual sense, but it's truly experienced. They experienced it with their bodily eyes. They experienced it with their minds. They experienced it with their hearts. So they experienced it with the whole, the whole of their being. Of course, it was for, for kind of a momentary period, but in that same experience, Palamas says, is what we as Christians have to look forward to in the age to come, in the resurrection. But that experience that was momentary becomes everlasting. What about a point that I, I know you brought up, uh, again, something we should not miss, <laughs> um, the role of the body in this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, would, you, would you say a few words about the fact that our spirituality, as, as we see it embodied in uh, St. Gregory Palamas's person and in his writings uh, does not leave the body behind when it comes to transformation by these uh, energies of God, neither in this age nor in age to come. One of the things that Barlam in particular was really offended by was this claim of the Hesychas to be able to see some kind of light with their eyes. <laughs> he says, wait, how does that 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 can't be, that can't be possible. This is some kind of you're using sort of symbolic language here. You know, this is not this is not really. They, they don't literally see a light. And Paloma <laughs> said, "No, actually, they do." And that in the life of prayer, um, the body is not excluded from the life of prayer. Um, prayer is not only a uh, mental energy and intellectual energy mental activity if you will um but is a bodily one. um this idea that people and people talk about it so much nowadays and sort of um all kinds of you know kind of new age type of spirituality well they'll say i want to have an out-of-body experience you know, that's kind of the goal is to have an out-of-body experience. And Paul Moss actually says, no, an, an out-of-body experience is a demonic delusion. If you're having an out-of-body experience, that's what the pagans wanted. That was, that's, what the, that's what the pagan Greeks wanted. They wanted to have this disembodied spiritual experience. No, that's actually not what we, what we as Christians should be striving for. We should not be striving for a, a disembodied experience, nor should we, should we be, dis, be striving for some kind of like a trance state where we don't, where we're, we're not aware mentally of what's going on. He said, that's not how it works either. And he gives the example of Moses taking the staff in his hand 
and praying, this God commands him to take the staff in his hand. He said, Moses physically takes the staff in his hand. This is not, you know, this is not a, a mental staff. You know, this is not a symbolic. He physically takes the staff in his hand. He, he's aware of what he's doing in his mind, but he's also praying, right? So, so all of these things actually kind of come together. And all of these things have to be um, active, energized at, at the same time. The, the heart, the mind, the, the noose, and the, and the body. And that's really what's going on, says Paul Amos, in the, um, uh, for the Hesychaths. Yeah, um, there is a question when they pray. That we receive which echoes some of the hesitations, again, among even among uh, contemporary Orthodox theologians. We, we spoke about, you know, Christ versus energies, uh, whether perhaps the talk of energy doesn't overshadow uh, Christ. But also, um, here's the question. While I deeply appreciate the works of St. Pala, Gregory Palamas, do you think there are instances where his emphasis on this type of experiential manifestation of the divine might overshadow the significance of the Eucharist? Um, well, so this is this is an instance. That's an excellent question. Excellent yes. question. Really, really important. So in this case, in this particular controversy, we do have to keep in mind the historical context that he wasn't really these weren't really um, the, the issues of the sacraments were not really things that he was debating at the time. But he was accused, even in his own time, of being a what was then called a Messalian, which is basically which was basically an anti-clerical, anti-sacramental sect from the fourth, fifth century. Um, there were there were people who were described as Messalians even in his own time, even on Mount Athos. Um, there, there was a lot of controversy around that. Um, but it's clear if you look at from his from his Palamas's other writings that he is not anti-clerical, that he is not anti-sacrament anti-sacramental, um, and in fact we commemorate um, him as the bishop of Thessaloniki. Right, right exactly. Um, he is, himself well, he obviously was a bishop. Um, he now there unfortunately there were some monks who did fall into that error, um, who did fall into the Messalian error, um, but the church always condemned that. Um, so really, um, in kind of an interesting way, Palamas's work uh, in the triads kind of has to be held together with someone like, say, Nicholas Cavasilas, who has a much stronger emphasis um, just in his, own, um, in his own writings on things like liturgy, sacraments. But really, they're talking about the same thing, that, that we experience the uncreated grace of God um, in the life of the church, including in, in the sacraments. These are not these are not um, exclusionary experiences. Um, the Hesychas monk saying his prayers, um, having an experience of of uncreated light, um, is not is not different from the from the uncreated grace that we experience in baptism or Eucharist or, or those kind of things. All of them lead towards uh, divinization. Yeah. So hopefully that that answers that. Yeah. I, and I I do I do understand that concern. Kind of when we were talking about it, it seems very sort of. Um, Almost like, well, well, what's the point of the uh, what's the point of the sacraments? What's the point of the church? Um, and that was always something actually that that um, the the monastic world had to articulate again and again and again. It's like we don't we don't sort of do this by ourselves. We don't we don't do this sort of independently of the church and of the sacramental life. These all of these things have to be integrated. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to add, since I see that we're nearing uh, nearing the time when uh, Peter Botenev will. Um, guide us towards the exit. Um, I don't want to miss out on um, uh, something that I find quite important, namely um, to highlight um, uh, what I think is important for us to always remember um, who it is that we're talking about when we are speaking about Christ. Um, and we say, ultimately, this experience is an experience of Christ. There is no way to have an experience of the divine energies by exactly. exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's important. what he means when he says and hypostatic. These are an exactly. experience of the person of Christ, right? Exactly. There's also no experience <clears throat> of the vision of the Father, because the face of the Father, the, the vision of the Father, the manifestation of the Father, the true icon is Christ. So it is always Christ. But 
Remember that St. Gregory spoke highly about um, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, um, Elijah the prophet, all these people whom he takes as exemplars of prayer and the experience in prayer of this light. And he has no hesitation saying that the same light, divine and divinizing, which will transfigure, which will be seen in the age to come, is the one that the apostles saw and continue to see the apostles and the disciples of the apostles at church in this age. But he emphatically says, I will also want to highlight this light uh, was tasted on, was tasted by the patriarchs and the prophets. And how is this even working? Unless you assume with Singri Palamas the same very, very old tradition um, in which um, we learn again and again, the experience is always that of Christ, even in the old covenant. Tell me, he writes, which of the angels was it who said to Moses, I am he who is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if not the son of God? As Basil the Great says, Notice, first of all, this is his conviction, which he could have picked up from learning the faith, uh, from hearing the faith um, in the hymns of the church, from seeing the faith depicted in iconography, or as a more learned theologian, this is a very learned theologian, by reading uh, St. Basil's Treatise Against Eunomius. Why is it written in the Exodus of Israel that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as one would to his own friend? As for him who conversed to with Abraham when he swore an oath by himself, if this had really been an angel, why does the apostle say that he could swear by none greater? And if God himself was well pleased to converse with the fathers under the shadow of the law, and if after the truth had been revealed and the law had been cleared up by grace, by which it was not an angel nor a man, but the Lord himself who saved us and the very spirit of God who told, told us all truth, how will God not be manifest by himself, through himself, to the saints? This, the, the larger framework is to, to argue against the notion that you cannot have a direct experience of God. You, there's always an angel, an intermediary. And that is why he's quoting this Isaiah 63 thing, not, not a man, not an angel. But the assumption, which he doesn't push too strongly because he assumes that <laughs> this is an assumption. Everybody knows this. Abraham and Moses and all the prophets uh, later on, they all have an experience of Christ under the cover of the law, but it is no other and no less than God himself, that is, God himself through the Son. With this assumption in place, I think it makes sense to speak about this continuum of experience uh, and of the divine light. Um, from from the patriarchs, the prophets, to the apostles, and to our very own days. What, what do you think? Does it work? Yeah, exactly. Um, I see uh, Peter has has rejoined us. Um, okay. Um, let me, yeah, let me just say really quickly, I think the best way to think about it is it's not a difference in quality, but a difference in quantity that we have from the the old covenant to the new covenant, to the, the everlasting age, to the, the age to come. It's not, it's not a different kind of experience, but it's a fullness. It's an increase of that experience. Um, to say that Moses or Elijah really experienced God, God himself, not a created intermediary. Um, that's completely fine because, again, that experience, which was once sort of it, it was sort of fleeting and it was only in special cases now becomes the common inheritance of the whole church of all christians that mm -hmm. becomes and and again that is our hope in the in the age to come sort of an abiding an abiding experience an abiding um to be in the abiding presence of christ um mm -hmm. in the in the in the fullest possible way so that's, that really, I think, is what it comes down to. There's a continuity there, and there's a qualitative continuity there, but there's a quantitative increase. It becomes fuller. And um, since, we are, uh, since we are going to um, um, celebrate 
Vespers and then uh, the Divine Liturgy of Transfiguration very shortly, uh, maybe there is a fitting way to, um, to end our uh, discussion in this segment um, by looking at how St. Gregory quotes the hymns of the Church to make sense of his ascetical uh, experience and that of his uh, fellow monastics. Um, the same hymns that we continue chanting and listening to uh, to this day. And the first text I have in mind is uh, on your screen. We have received the tradition of saying that Christ, of saying together to Christ, that the foremost apostles, having beheld on the mountain the boundlessness of your surge of light and the unapproachability of your divinity, were altered by the divine ecstasy. This is a remarkable phrase. The apostles were altered by God's own coming out of himself towards them. And we said it, we say this, we celebrate this, and we try to taste of this in the feast of the church. Um, Alex, thank you very much for uh, for joining me um, and joining us at St. Vlad's uh, in this uh, Ed day. Um, I think it's time to pass on the baton. And to answer this person's question, yes, we can say it is grace. <laughs> <laughs> the energy, yes, yes, exactly. I'm the so uh, you, you the energies are um, are another way of saying uncreated grace. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you you ended there. Um, there's also a quotation somewhere from Palamas where he says the energies are nothing else than the will of God. Mm -hmm. harmony of will and action um, and in this sense um, the universality of the presence of the energies of God um, especially if we sort of de-physicalize them you know we think of energy as kind of a field of some sort that is coming at us and and see it instead as the, the actions of God uh, which of course our participation in that will always see its fulfillment in a Christian, Christ-filled participation, but it is accessible to all. Um, and I love the uh, the hymn that I posted in the chat window is for today, the Eve of Transfiguration, where it says, um, all of mortal nature now divinely shines on this day of the pre-feast. Um, it, it's, it's, it's lovely. So there's always a kind of a Christian and sacramental particularity to what's happening, but the uh, the possibility the the access is universal, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say? Sure, I mean, Not yeah. Well it's, <laughs> it. <laughs> well, it's certainly yeah. I mean, it, it is certainly the the hope. You know, again, the the hope of Christians that um, this will be again kind of the universal. Um, everlasting experience um and again in the resurrection um i suppose whether whether you like it or not <laughs> yeah 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 um in the resurrection um uh, no, the access is universal that doesn't necessarily mean you know whatever we don't need to right else. <laughs> and, uh, if i'm getting in, into eschatological speculation um but uh <laughs> yeah ex exactly yeah no it's a it's a it's a it's a universal transfiguration of, of nature yeah absolutely